welcome back to another episode of Opal Wave MTG, a channel dedicated to exploring power levels in EDH and helping you tune your deck to your meta. I'm your host Jacob and today's episode is going to be about Hinzi Toolbox Tore, which is a 3 mana Jund, which is black, red, and green, 3-3 three, three double rogue legendary creature. With each creature spell you cast with mana value 4 or greater has Blitz. The Blitz cost is equal to its mana cost and Blitz gives the creature haste. When the creature dies, you draw a card and you sacrifice that creature at the beginning of the next end step. Blitz costs you pay cost one less to cast for each time you've cast your commander from the command zone this game. So a really cool, uh, I mean literally a, a toolbox type of commander where you can you know use all these big fatties and reduce their costs and cheat them into play. There's a lot of really uh, cool things you can do with this commander. The oops all creature version of this deck is the battle version. And that should be bookmarked below, so if you want to just go ahead and skip to that version, uh, that's all good. Go ahead and go there. As usual, the deck lists are in the description below. If you want to help support our channel, check out my Fiverr, and let's go ahead and get started. So for the skirmish version of Hinzi, which is our lowest power level, I went with... Uh, Hydra Tribal. I thought it would be fun if we use Hinzi's ability to reduce the cost of our Hydras and then do a little bit of plus one plus one counter synergies so we can move around the counters that the Hydras enter the battlefield with. So we've got a few creatures that aren't necessarily Hydras like Agent of Erebos, uh, Bane of Progress, some of these more utility type stuff, ways that we can still interact with our opponents, Ravenous Chupacabra, and they're actually going to get reduced by Hinzi because they are for Raider. So it's a really nice utility and we get to draw that extra card off of it. So then we've got just a bunch of Hydras, the Capricorn, Hooded Hydra, uh, Steel Bane Hydra. I mean, all these creatures are just gonna be entering them with a bunch of plus and plus one counters. And then we have things like Deathbringer Thogter, which whenever another creature dies, you put a plus one plus one counter on the Thogter and then you can remove a counter to deal one damage to any target. Then we've got cards like Slurk All Ingesting, uh, or whenever Slurk or another creature you control dies, if it had a plus one plus one counter on it, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control that has a plus one plus one counter on it. So when our Hydras die, we'll be able to get more counters on our Deathbringer Thoctor. Uh, Stalking Vengeance, whenever another creature you control dies, it deals damage to equal to its power to any target, which another, or sorry, target player or planeswalker, a really great finisher since we can you know, get these hydras up to be really really big and they die and then we deal uh, a good amount of damage to our opponents. Just to, to highlight a few more ways we can kind of mess around with the counters, you got the Ozolith, which whenever a creature you control leaves the battlefield, I had a counter on it, put those counters on the Ozolith, and in the beginning of combat, if the Ozolith has counters on it, you can move those counters on to another permanent. And then we also have Death's presence whenever a creature you control dies put x plus one plus one counters on target creature you control where x is the power of the creature that died so we'll be able to take advantage of this of our hydras dying by either making our other hydras bigger or you know doing some cool stuff like the death bringer thopter or we can even just make hinzi really big and start swinging at people with that so it could be pretty interesting we also have rayhan uh which does essentially what the other cards are doing whenever a creature control dies or is put into the command zone if it had one or more plus one plus one counters on it you would put that many plus one plus one counters on target creature so just a bunch of ways for us to kind of move around our uh, counters from our hydras get some extra advantage off of them dying and just beat face with them so pretty sweet and the sorcery is just a few ramp spells and a blasphemous axe so we can wipe the board. And, you know, we've got the, the removal in our creatures, so uh, we don't need to add a ton more removal since we are in that lower power level. Um, you know, the removal is going to be a little bit more sparse than it is in the other power levels. And then with the incense, we've just got a few removal spells, Beats Within, the Devil, Chaos Warp, uh, just some, you know, really fine ways to interact with our opponents the tragic slip is really nice since we will be able to trigger that morbid pretty easily since Hinzi is going to make our creatures uh, with blitz you know sacrifice at the end of the turn the artifacts are also pretty straightforward uh, just you know a few ramp spells and I thought it would be a cool place to put the uh, crowded crypt 
uh, whenever a creature control dies, put a corpse counter on it, and then you can sack it and you make a 2-2 black zombie for each counter on it. So as you're playing the game as you regularly would, you get to accrue the counters on your crowded crypt, and then you just get that extra late game oomph that you need sometimes. And again, we've got that Ozlith to really take advantage of the counter strategy that we're doing here. The enchantments are actually pretty cool. Um, so Bard class, since we do want to cast Hinzi, you know, multiple times so we can get extra, uh, you know, effect out of the uh, Blitz cost, cost one less to cast for each time you cast your commander from the commands in this game, the easier we can recast our Hinzi when he's removed, the better off we are so we can get even more value and cheaper cost for our Hydras. So Bard class on the second tier or the level two legendary spells you cast cost two a green and a red less to cast this effect reduces only the amount of colored mana you pay and then uh you know it's also got the five whenever you cast a legendary spell exile the top two cards of your library you may play them this turn so it's a great way to reduce the cost on hensy and when we recast them we can get some extra value out of it we already went over the Death's Presence as a way to make our board nice and big. Elemental Bond, just for some extra draw power, Evolutionary Leap. The creatures are going to die anyway. So being able to use Evolutionary Leap to, one, you know, draw the card. Because with Blitz, it doesn't matter how the creature dies. It's just when the creature dies, you draw a card. And then, we're, you know, like I said, we're going to lose that creature anyway. So we might as well sacrifice it. We still get that value. So we get to draw the card, and then we can just find the next creature that we want to cast. Feed the pack. Um, again, this is another, you know, way for us to take advantage. Since the creature's going to die anyway, we might as well, you know, sack it on our own terms. So feed the pack, we can sacrifice a non-token creature. We get X, 2-2 two, two green wolf creature tokens, where X is the sacrifice creature's toughness. Gutter Grime, another way for us to make tokens when our non-token creatures die and that oozes the power and toughness equal to the number of slime counters on gutter grime and every time a creature dies you put a counter on it and you make a slime industrial advancements uh, this is at the beginning of your end step you may sacrifice a creature so again another way for us to take advantage since we're going to lose that creature anyway we can look at the top x cards of our library where x is the creature's mana value you may put that creature card from among them into the battlefield, put the rest of the bottom of your library in a random order. And it's a little awkward since we are on, um, you know, kind of this Hydra tribal thing. When, you know, some of these creatures die, they'll just be considered two because X is zero uh, since it's, you know, we're not, it, X is considered whatever X is while it's on the stack. But once it's on the field, it's uh, considered a two mana. But we do have some of the other, you know, bigger stuff like the Uvenwolf Hydra, the Stalking Vengeance, the Whip Tongue Hydra, um, that can still trigger, um, you know, and, and actually get some pretty good value out of it. So, Malevolent Awakening. So we pay three, sacrifice a creature, return target creature from your graveyard to your hand. So if you got something that you don't really want anymore, uh, you know, you can just sag it, or if it's already blitzed into play, we can sacrifice that creature and return another creature from our graveyard to our hand so we can just keep the blitz train going. Myth Unbound, another way for us to reduce the cost of Henzi. So every time, uh, you know, we cast our commander from the command zone, it's going to cost one less. So instead of the commander tax being two, it's essentially just one. And whenever your commander is put into the command zone from anywhere, you draw a card. So some extra value and just a way for us to make our Henzi cheaper. One with the Kami is a, an enchantment from the uh, uh, Neon Dynasty pre-con. Uh, so enchanted creature, uh, you know, you enchant a creature you control, and whenever enchanted creature or another modified creature you control dies, create X 1-1 one, one color spirit creature tokens, where X is that creature's power. And a modified creature is anything that's enchanted, equipped, or has a counter on it. And since the Hydras are gonna get those counters, they are considered to be modified. Uh, so pretty interesting interaction there. Where we'll be able to make a bunch of dudes when our guys die. Riveter Ascendancy, another way. Uh, this is more of just a trigger that happens when we do sacrifice a creature. We can return another target card. Creature card with lesser mana value from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So uh, this card is actually really strong and in my opinion was probably one of the better ascendancies that was printed um 
so yeah super strong and again it's got a little awkward because uh these you know some of these hydras are going to be casting or counting towards as, as just two but we do have some other cards that we can keep recurring for value like solemn simulacrum ravenous chupacabra some of our removal type stuff um will be really good uh once we get that you know, going get in and out every turn unbound flourishing so whenever you cast a permanent spell with mana value uh, that contains X, double the mana, the value of X. So basically, I mean, pretty straightforward. Uh, we're not really using the instant sorcery activated ability type stuff. We don't really have any X in our costs, I don't believe. And lastly, as a vicious shadows, whenever a creature is put into a graveyard from play, you may have vicious shadows deal damage to target player equal to the number of cards in that player's hand. And this is another just super strong card and this is whenever a creature dies not just your creature so this card definitely ends games very fast and can do a ton of damage especially to that control player who likes to keep you know a full grip in their hand at all times moving on to the lands uh, yeah just super basic we got a bajuka box so we can you know deal with people's graveyards uh then yeah you know just cheap lands that can enter tapped or untapped potentially potentially got the temple so we can scry soul for mire and and friends uh so we can make sure we hit our colors but yeah nothing really crazy here so and moving on to the battle version of henzi toolbox Torre. i went down a little bit of a rabbit hole when i was initially just trying to figure out how I wanted to brew Hinzi, what I wanted to do with it, and I thought about the Blitz cost and how he reduces the costs, and so I thought, well, let me just try doing a bunch of cost reducers, and then I found Mori, the collector, um, who can be your partner, and in order to have it as your companion, each non-land card in your starting deck has to share a card type. And then its ability is as Umori, the collector enters the battlefield, choose a card type, and spells you cast of the chosen type cost one less to cast. And since uh, Blitz is an alternate casting cost, that cost can get reduced by your other cost reducers. Uh, so yeah, I, um, that's kind of how I um, ended up with Umori as my companion and doing an Oops All Creature build. Uh, might actually do a video in the future about you know top-down deck building or versus you know bottom-up deck building. Uh, in this case, I you know saw Hinzi and looked at his abilities and then kind of went on from there, you know, top-down kind of a thing. Uh, so the other thing is you know this deck is a little organ is organized a little bit differently than I normally do. Uh, you know, in most of the time my brain just likes to see creatures, instants, sorceries, artifacts, and shamans, lands. Um, but, you know, let, let me just show you what this looks like without the tags. Um, it's just a big old jumbled mess of creatures. And, in, you know, in my brain this just doesn't really look right. Uh, and then, you know, obviously we got the lands here too. So in order to organize this a little bit better, I did types and tags. I created my own custom tags. And uh, yeah, it definitely makes a little bit more sense. So let's check out the the first section I have here is the cost reducers. So these are all just gonna you know make our creatures cost less. Gore Claw is really cool. Creatures with power four or greater cost two less to cast. Crossing Drover creature spells with converted mana cost six or more cost two less to cast. Marauding Raptor is gonna make all our dudes cost less. While Marauding Raptor is also gonna deal damage to the creatures when they enter the battlefield, which isn't too big of a deal unless we're trying to cast some of a ramp, but we should ideally be playing a ramp before we get this guy out. Uh, Duskwatch Recruiter can make our uh, dudes cost less on the flip side. Uh, do it like that. And the front side just gives us a little bit of card advantage. The Conduit of Ruin, now that we do have some Eldrazi in here because since they are colorless and you know outside of a few of them needing specifically colorless mana to, to cast i in my playtesting i've been able to hit you know being able to pay like one two or even zero sometimes for our colorless creatures so conduit of ruin when it enters you can search your library for a colorless creature card with converted mana cost seven or greater reveal it shuffle your library and then put that card on top of it the first creature spell you cast each turn costs two less to cast and 
it's uh you know the the cost reduction doesn't apply to just colorless creatures or anything it's literally the first creature spell you cast each turn costs two less to cast so really great cost reducer and a tutor for some of our big eldrazi cemetery prowler a little bit of card exile and we also get just the added benefit once we exile a creature that our spells will cost uh, one less so pretty sweet uh, Nylia keen eyed also does the creature spells you cast one less to cast as well as just being pretty hard to interact with since it is indestructible and it also has the added utility like Duskwatch where we can pay mana and potentially get Creatures. And since our deck is literally entirely creatures, uh, the only way we're going to miss is if we hit a land. So, uh, pretty sweet. And then we're moving on to the ramp. <clears throat> uh, you know, we've, we've, we've got a few dorks. We've got uh, the Somberwald Sage is pretty sweet. Shaman of the Forgotten Ways. Uh, Migratory. Great Horn is another pretty interesting one where we can mutate it, mutate it onto a creature. And then we can search for a basic land. Beanstalk Giant is also a creature that has the uh, adventure mechanic which is basically just pay three mana search your library for a basic put it in the battlefield and then later on we can cast beanstalk giant um you know if we want to and we have a bunch of lands out so some nice you know extra utility because we can also cast it from exile for its blitz cost uh, with henzy so and be able to draw an additional card off that as well so super sweet uh, then yeah just a bunch of dudes that can help us get uh, lands onto the battlefield, and I, you know, I kind of wanted something that could. I didn't want to lean too heavily into all dorks just because of the raptor. Um, you know, at least with like Mega Trigger Horn or the Beanstalk Giant, or I mean, even these guys, where you can sacrifice them in response to the marauding uh, damage trigger so they don't, you know, they won't die before you actually get your land, um, or the Spring Bloom Druid where you're just going to get your value before it even triggers. So. You know, I had a few dorks in here still just to kind of get that turn to Hinzy sometimes. Um, but I did want to play around the Marauding Raptor just a little bit. And removal. So in these decks, it's really important that you do have removal. And, you know, you do want some of your removal to be able to be activated at instant speed. So you aren't stuck at being just a sorcery uh, deck. You, you do want a few ways to interact with an instant speed. So we've got stuff like Cast Caterpillar. Oh, Caustic Caterpillar, uh, Thrashing Broadstone, where you can sacrifice them to exile, or sorry, destroy an artifact or enchantment. We've got the Scavenging Ooze, uh, just the extra way for us to interact with our opponent's graveyards. Jiwari, the Earth Flame, is a really sweet one. Uh, old card from the Kamigawa block, but it has Channel X and 3 red. And you discard uh, Jiwari. And Jawari deals X damage to each creature without flying. So this is a board wipe essentially um, that we don't have. I mean, we can just activate the channel ability, and channel can be done on instant speed. Uh, so potentially an instant speed board wipe is pretty sweet. And uh, speaking of more board wipes, we've got Orcus, Prince of Undeath. When it enters the battlefield, you choose one. Each other creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn. You lose X life. Or you can return up to X target creature cards with total mana value X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. They gain haste until end of turn. Um, so Henzi's just going to make that X cost just a little bit less. Uh, make it easier for us to either wipe the board or potentially use this to just like overrun our opponents. Potentially if the game's going on later and we just kind of find this guy. Uh, we've still got the Ravenous Chupacabra. Bone Crusher Giant has the Stomp, where we deal to hue damage to any target, and damage can't be prevented this turn. Bane of Progress to wipe everything. World Breaker is uh, you know kind of a foreshadowing of some of the bigger things in the deck. We've got the you know being able to exile stuff, and you know these are cast triggers on some of these Eldrazi's. Uh, so it doesn't, you know, we'll be able to cast them for their blitz cost and, you know, get these really sweet abilities for cheap. We've got Kogla, the Titan Ape, another really sweet form of removal where he fights things and destroys artifacts and enchantments when uh, he does swing. And then Steel, Hellkite, and the Duplicant are also super sweet in this deck. Uh, in playtesting, I was able to cast Steel, Hellkite, blitz out Steel, Hellkite for zero mana. And then have a bunch of mana up to uh, activate the Steel Hellkite ability. So, um, yeah, that was that was actually pretty sweet. Duplicate, same thing. Potentially cast this bad boy for zero. 
and with the uh, tutors found some really interesting tutor options the rootless you from uh, Kaldheim when it dies you search your library for a creature card with toughness or power six or greater reveal it put it into your hand and shuffle your library so we can blitz this thing out at the end of the turn it's going to die and then we'll be able to search up for one of our big dudes for the next turn fierce empath another way for us to get something with cmc six or greater brutal arg brutalizer exarch will put a creature on top of our library or it can be used as removal in a pinch even will hydra can find uh you know just some really sweet lands i like this card a lot uh, you know, we've got the like Moss Warp Bridge, Sanctum of Ugin, uh, you know, Emergent Zone, a lot of a lot of utility lands that can help us, you know, get some of our colossal drowsy out. So DC Undead Vizier, another really sweet way for us to tutor. Woodland Bellor, Rune Scarred Demon, and the Fauna Shaman. All these cards will do a lot of work tutoring in our deck. And then I've got a utility section. Um, where you know we've got ways to kind of recur our creatures so like the eternal witness just fantastic most most of the time being able to get stuff back chainer where we can discard a card and then cast a speed creature spell from our graveyard you can only activate this once a turn the cool thing about chainer's ability though is that he lets you cast those spells from your graveyard and it's not an alternate cost and uh, because it's not an alternate cost, we can still cast our spells using Henzi's ability, giving the blitz. So we can cast them for their blitz costs from the graveyard using Chainer's ability, which is super sweet. Viscerous here is a sack outlet because it's just really nice to have um, a way to sacrifice our stuff at instant speed in general, get around certain board wipes and exile and all that stuff. And it's also gonna be uh, enable one of our combos in the deck. Nikia, the always, plays right into what we want to do. You can't cast non-creature spells. That's perfectly fine. Um, we have like two non-creature spells in the deck with like Blex on the backside being a sorcery and like, you know, Bone Crusher or uh, Beanstalk Giant. We can't, you know, use those uh, adventure abilities, which, I mean, it's three cards out of the, the 99 that we can't cast. So, you know, we can still cast a creature side too, so. But... Whenever you tap a land for mana, add one mana of any type that land produced, so a creature that can double our mana. And if you want to get really crazy with it, you know, you got a couple of cost reducers out, you could slam this thing out for two mana using the Blitz ability and just, you know, kind of surge out a bunch of mana in one turn. Artisan of Kozilek can also uh, return creatures from our graveyard to the battlefield when it is cast. Genesis, uh, when, you know, at the beginning of your upkeep, if it's in your graveyard, you can pay three. And return a creature card from your graveyard to your hand really great card um, especially since with Hinzi we can blitz it out and just kill it so we don't you know we don't have to cast it and just hope it dies eventually we can literally just kill it ourselves and draw that extra card so not bad as I mentioned before we've got Blex and we're not really gonna be casting Blex for the um, you know regular black side but the back side is search for blacks look at the top five cards in your library you put any number of them into your hand and the rest into your graveyard you lose three life for each card you put into your hand this way so a nice little card uh, I thought it'd be fun since we're doing this like creature only build to like try to jam in some way to, to you know, cast the sorcery uh, Tamer Sabretooth super strong in this deck blitz out our creatures and then we can activate Tamer Sabretooth to put them back into our hand before uh, we have to sacrifice them unfortunately you won't be able to get your death trigger and draw a card from the blitz ability but you're you know you can potentially get a lot of different ETBs out of this thing it's gonna be really strong Vizier of the Menagerie uh, just you know lets us get some extra value by casting spells, creature spells from the top of our library, and we can use mana as though it were any type to cast creature spells, which is actually really important. Um, you know, so we can cast uh, specifically Kozilek, since it's the only one that actually needs two colors to cast. Uh, Wandering Archaic, a really sweet card. Um, yeah, not, don't really have too many more, too much more to say about that one. Junji, uh, a way for us to reanimate some of our creatures from the graveyard since we can blitz this out. We'll get our death trigger at the end of the turn. Either be, you know, kind of rude, make each player discard two cards, or you can get a non-dragon creature from your graveyard to the battlefield, which would be pretty sweet. 
And then we've got a Micaeus to get that extra value, um, you know, when our creatures die and we blitz them out. And so one of our combo type things is with Micaeus, the Viscera Seer, and if you noticed earlier, we have the Woodfall Primus. So whenever this thing enters a battlefield, destroy target non-creature permanent, and it has Persist. So even normally, if you blitz this out at the end of the turn, it's gonna die. It comes back as a 5-5 because of the Persist ability. But if you have a Micaeus out as well, um, you can alternate between the minus counter being on it and the plus counter on it with the Viserys here. So essentially, uh, the Woodfall Promise is going to die. It's going to enter the. You're going to get two triggers: a persist trigger as well as an undying trigger. And so you choose which one of those resolve first, because the other one's not going to resolve. So let's say we have the persist trigger resolve first. So persist is going to resolve, and it's going to enter the battlefield with a with a minus one minus one counter on it. Then we sacrifice it to Viserys here, and our Undying is going to trigger, which will bring it back with a plus one, plus one counter on it. Then we can sacrifice it again, and the Persist trigger will happen, comes with a minus one, minus one counter, and then the McKay, we just go back and forth, and from there, we'll full promise, we'll destroy all of our opponent's non-creature permanence, or your own if you really want to get spicy with it. Um, I don't recommend that, but you can do that, because you can target your own stuff. Um, so yeah, super sweet uh, combo, and then Chaos is just really great in the deck in general. So, And the last section I have is this win condition section. Uh, so we've got Seki Season's Guide, and this one looks a little weird um, at first glance, but it is one of our combo pieces. And this is a really cool combo um, that I've actually never seen played against me, so I just wanted to build a deck that could actually use the combo. So we've got our Terror of the Peaks here, which is whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Terror of the Peaks deals damage equal to that creature's power to any target. And Seki Season's Guide comes into play with eight plus one plus one counters on it. If damage would be dealt to Seki, prevent that damage, remove that many plus one plus one counters from Seki, and put that many one one colorless spirit creature tokens into play. Sacrifice eight spirits, return Seki from your graveyard to play. So what we're gonna do is, so we're going to have our Terror of the Peaks out, and then we are going to cast Seki Season's Guide, and that is going to trigger Terror of the Peaks. And so now, Terror of the Peaks is going to deal 8 damage to Seki, because Seki is an 8-8. Eight eight. So we're going to deal 8 damage to Seki, and then Seki is going to prevent that damage, and we're going to remove 8 counters from Seki. So Seki is going to go into our graveyard, and we're going to end up with 8 Spirits. All of those spirits are going to trigger Terror of the Peaks. So Terror of the Peaks is going to deal eight more damage divided in any way you choose to whatever targets. Then we're going to activate Seki's last ability, Sacrifice Eight Spirits, to return Seki from your graveyard to play. So Seki's going to re-enter the battlefield once we sacrifice those spirits. And that's going to trigger Terror of the Peaks again. And then we can have Terror of the Peaks deal eight damage to Seki again, which will make eight of those spirits spirits will hit our opponents sacrifice and bring Se uh, Seki back rinse and repeat over and over and over again uh, and then yeah that will kill the table and uh, then you know the rest of them are just the the drowsy type stuff we have so void winner are not something we really want to be blitzing out necessarily but once we get a few cost reducers um, you know minus two minus two minus two uh, minus one plus you know Umari uh, you know we can be casting a void winner for like four mana three or four mana which could be pretty sweet if that betrays uh, you know whenever an opponent sacrifices an own token permanent we're gonna get that permanent and it has a nine liter two and we can blitz it out super sweet cuz like uh, when it when you cast it and you have less than seven cards in hand, you're gonna draw equal to the difference, and then you can discard cards to counter things potentially. Uh, really great since we don't have, I mean, in our colors, we generally don't have a lot of counter magic. Um, but yeah, super sweet that we get access to something like that. Again, we've got Terror of the Peaks. Even outside of the combo, this is just going to kill people if it's left unanswered. Immacruel, the promised end, uh, we can gain control of our opponents when we cast this spell, 
uh, flying trample protection from instance, it's a 1313. Um, another interesting thing is it's gonna cost one less for each card type among cards in your graveyard. Um, so it's generally just gonna be reduced by one. Uh, so Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger, uh, whenever we attack, if the new player exiles the top 20 cards in their library, and when you cast this, exile two target permanents, Ulamog destroys a permanent. When you cast it, it's gonna annihilate a four. And then Kozilek just draws four cards when you cast this. And when these go to your graveyard, they are going to shuffle back into your library. Uh, so that's why it's really nice to have the Timber Sabertooth so we can cast these two guys for hopefully really cheap, swing with them, and then bring them back to our hand. Uh, should be really sweet. And then moving on to our lands, the don't mind the Z in front of the lands. It was the only way I could have lands be the last thing on this section. We've added more lands that can enter on tap potentially. We've added Blast Zone to supplement our removal a little bit more. Uh, emergent Zone so we can play some stuff on our opponent's turn. And then just some lands that help support our Eldrazi tribal type thing. Uh, so you, know, you can add two colors with the Eldrazi Temple. Sanctum of Ugin can let us tutor for uh, some of our in-game type of stuff when we cast the big creatures. I have Ugin can also let us search for, uh, you know, colorless creatures, and also just makes our colorless Eldrazi spells cost two less to cast, which is super sweet. So another cost reducer. Uh, Basaju, again, we want to supplement our removal since we are on creatures and you know don't have access to a ton of uh, instant speed stuff. If you've enjoyed the content so far and you feel like you've gained a little bit more perspective in power levels in EDH, uh, be sure to like subscribe and leave a comment below letting me know what commander you want to see brewed next. Moving on to the glory version of Hinzi, which is essentially CDH. We could have done a few different things with this build and I kind of wanted to go with a turbo necrotic ooze build. Uh, some of the other builds I've seen have done like, you know, turbo hulk strategies where you use Hinzi's blitz ability to get turbo hulk, or to get your protean hulk to die on your instep. I thought it'd be cool to do necrotic ooze. It's an old school uh, type of wind con that you don't really see too often anymore. But the cool thing about Necrotic Ooze is that in the context of this deck, Henzi's going to make it cost one less, but Henzi's Blitz ability will give Necrotic Ooze haste, which kind of opens up some of our Necrotic Ooze lines that are generally aren't, uh, you know, amazing since uh, you want your wind cons to to be less telegraphed so if you have to resolve a necrotic ooze and then give the entire table around to interact with that necrotic ooze it's not as good so we want to be able to cast our necrotic ooze and just win so we have the phyrexian devourer plus walking ballista where we can use the phyrexian devourer to exile our library and put counters on the necrotic ooze and then the walking ballista remove a counter to deal one damage so we can kill the table and that means that we don't need the haste on Necrotic Goose uh, to kill the table. Um, but the other line we have is the Kiki Jiggy plus Mog Fanatic. So we blitz in our Necrotic Goose and then we can tap our Necrotic Goose to make another copy of Necrotic Goose. And from there we just make ne infinite Necrotic Oozes. And then we can use the Mog Fanatic ability to sacrifice the Necrotic Oozes to kill the table. We've also added a little bit of layering with the Kiki by adding a Combat Celebrant and a Hyrax Tower Scout so we don't have to rely too heavily on the Necrotic Goose um, in order to get a win off. Uh, we can use the Kiki Jiggy in other ways to win. Um, just filled out the ramp with a bunch of dorks, added a Sylvan Safekeeper to protect our Necrotic Goose. We've added a Villas Broker of Blood and a Razaketh the Foul-Blooded, some of the big beat stuff that we can either potentially blitz in or we can just cheat into play with like a reanimate or something. And uh, moving on to the sorceries, we've actually added the Buried Alive and this is going to be one of the better cards in our deck. This is going to be how we set up our combos. And there's a few different ways we can do this. We can either put uh, you know, Necrotic Ooze, Walking Ballista, plus the Phyrexian Devourer in our graveyard. We can put Kiki Jiki plus Hyrex Tower Scout, plus the Phyrexian Delver into our graveyard. It just depends on what other cards you have in your hand. 
And so for example, let's say we buried alive, we'll put the Kiki Jiki, Varexi Nilver, and the Hyrex Tower Scout into our graveyard. And then we can cast the Reanimate targeting our Phyrexian Delver. So this is Delver is going to enter the battlefield, and then we can reanimate our Kiki Jiki. Then we can activate Kiki Jiki to uh, make another Phyrexian Delver, which is going to get a Hyrex Tower Scout. Hyrex Tower Scout is going to enter and on top our Kiki, and then from there we can make infinite Hyrex Tower Scouts. And the other uh, scenario we have, we just do Necroticus, Phyrexian Devourer, and a Walking Ballista. We can just reanimate our Necroticus and just immediately win. If you also have, you know, like a Worldly Tutor in your hand uh, or something like that, or, or the Necroticus is already in your hand, your Buried Alive pile can be uh, just the Kiki Jiki plus the Mog Fanatic. Uh, plus, I mean, any other creature that you really want, and you can just cast your Necrotic Ooze and win from there. Uh, Culling Rituals, super sweet, CDH, a lot of small stuff. This is going to generate a ton of value, potentially, you know, cast the Villas or Razageth uh, pretty early. We got the, the Tutors, little Eldritch Revolution, Finale and Devastation, Faithless Looting, an extra way for us to get some of those cards we'd have in our hand into our graveyard, like a Villas or a. Uh, uh, Razaketh, if you you know if we want to reanimate it, Gamble, Imperial Seal, uh, again the reanimate Thoughtseize, so we can interact with our opponents, make sure that control player doesn't have that extra piece of removal or counter magic before we try to win, and a Wheel of Fortune to reset our hands. In the instance, uh, we've got you know the cream of the crop here, Braid, Abrupt Decay, Assassin's Trophy, all super strong. And quarter Calling is another tutor crop rotation to get some of our better lands like more or less the, the guy's cradle and tomb so we can get some important things into our graveyard calling the week to help ramp into some of our other win cons uh veil of summer to protect ourselves and again that worldly tutor vampiric tutor just to to get some extra tutor and go and get our combos off super fast and moving on to the artifacts we've got chromox Lotus Petal just really updated our our ramp here uh, since we didn't really, you know, get options uh, as far as artifact ramp because of our deck building restriction. Uh, you know, we definitely upgraded and just lowered the cost of our our ramp and added more of it so we can get our game plan on um, you know more efficiently. Added a Wish Claw Talisman has extra uh, tutoring power. And then a few more of the uh, reanimate stuff like Dance of the Dead, Animate Dead, uh, Carpet of Flowers for extra ramp, Necropotence is a super sweet card advantage, super sweet card advantage engine, Survival of the Fittest so we can find some of those important creatures, Wild Growth and a Sylvan Library, this will help us draw at the extra cards, and the Wild Growth for ramp. And lastly, the lands. We Pretty much just you know upgraded our land base everything is entering the battlefield untapped we've got the phyrexian tower uh, great way to sacrifice creatures and add extra mana ancient tomb adds two colorless uh, we've still got the besaju again it's a pretty straightforward you know as we're moving up power levels getting our lands to be more efficient and that way we don't need to run as many of them and also we have got a bunch of ramp uh, so you know we don't need to be drawing a bunch of lands. Thanks for checking out this episode of Opal Wave MTG. Again, I'm your host, Jacob, and until next time.